Hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is Priya Chaya, and I am the Associate Director of Content here at the National Trust for Historic Preservation. This year's Preservation Month theme is People Saving Places, and it's our way of giving a national high five to everyone doing the great work of saving places in ways big and small, all while inspiring others to do the same. Today, I'd like to invite you and welcome you to From in Aspiration to Inspiration, one of our signature events for this year's Preservation Month. Uh, today, you guys are very lucky. You get to hear from some amazing preservationists. Um, since 2011, the National Trust has awarded the American Express Aspire Award to emerging leaders in the preservation field. And so we have brought together six of the past awardees to share their success stories, lessons learned, and biggest hopes for, the, for preservation in the years to come. I'm gonna let all our panelists introduce themselves briefly, but for longer bios, you can visit savingplaces.org slash preservation hyphen month. And then we'll do a little icebreaker followed by a conversation with the group. So to get us started, I'm going to reintroduce myself before I hand it off to Tyrell. And so here goes. Hello, my name is Priya Chaya and I save places primarily through the written word. At the National Trust, I share the stories behind the people and places that make up our full American story. Go ahead, Tyrell. All right. My name is Tyrell Anderson, and I say places by creating placemaking and art events around our historic landmarks. Hi, I'm Allison King, and I say places by making sure people know where they are in the first place so I can motivate them to rally around them and save them if needed. Hi, I'm uh, Josh Rogers, and I say places by um, coaching and training uh, people who have been underserved by the traditional financial institutions so that they can make investments in historic buildings and neighborhoods that help them build wealth and uh, build incomes while saving those places. Hi, I'm Jordan Ryan, and I save places through my work archiving built environment materials and working on research and interpretation projects involving housing, neighborhoods, and planning policies and issues. Hi, everyone. My name is Allison Tunin Talamo, and I save places by hanging off of them to make sure that they're structurally safe and make sure that they're helping the community out and act as a building and closure consultant. Hi everyone, I'm Rosalind Sagara, and I save places by bringing people and resources together to find solutions to community challenges and opportunities. <laughs> Unmuted, the nature of virtual meetings. Um, as you can see, everyone is coming from very different places. And so I thought to kick everything off, we're gonna do a little icebreaker. And what I've asked everyone to do is uh, share with us a historic place that they wish more people would know about. And so we're gonna start with Tyrell again. So the historic place I chose was a Freeman's town in Houston, Texas on uh, the fourth ward. I actually learned about it from a previous uh, National Trust uh, virtual conference. And for those who are not familiar with Freeman's towns, those were areas that were settled by former slaves uh, after the Civil War. So it was really great just to see, you know, the architecture and the, the work that went into, you know, the, the school buildings, the churches, those homes at those times uh, when the individuals were uh, getting free. Um, so I didn't know about it until I heard at the trust and I thought that's something that more people should know about. I'm gonna do a little screen share here to show you my spot. Uh, this is in Phoenix, Arizona, and this is the Phoenix Financial Center by W.A. Sarmiento, who was an architect commissioned to build an amazing bank complex in the 1960s. And I mean, just look at this thing. It's amazing. It's a complete work of art um, and it's, it's total design. <laughs> And I just love it because of its, um, first of all, its, its artistic beauty is unrivaled. Um, I mean, concrete expressionism, amazing. <laughs> um, but also it helps tell the story of Phoenix and um, the, the boom of, of growth that we had here in mid-century, which is really kind of our, it's our time. And um, I've chosen this place because um, 
it re is really representative of many commercial properties here in Phoenix that are eligible for historic preservation and some protections, but have um, not really taken that step yet. It's a very common story here in Phoenix. And so um, we you know, like to keep an eye on these properties and make sure that the owners know what they have and appreciate what they have. I've got a vintage uh, interior here because the interior was designed by some local architects. Um, uh, Ralph Wyatt and Frank Martin, who were interior designers. And the interior has been refurbished and taken back to what it still looks like uh, today. And uh, we can really thank Shepley Bullfinch for doing that um, in their architectural offices there in one of the rotundas. And then um, another group of word projects has also uh, renovated the other rotunda. So that's my space. And I love it. My favorite place in all of Phoenix. Allison, I love the stained glass. Mm, that's by Glass Art Studio, and they are a nationally acclaimed uh, artisan glass studio that was in Scottsdale in mid-century, and they did churches and um, civic buildings and all sorts of commissions nationwide in that very kind of mod style. Cool. And the inspiration for my background, actually, too, they were, they were very much an inspiration when I was creating the artwork. Awesome. Josh. So I, I picked a place that's really um, played a significant role during all my time here in Macon. Um, it's Ogmulgee Mounds National Historical Park. Um, and it's one of the few places in North America that's been continuously inhabited by humans for the last 12,000 years. And one of the coolest things in it is uh, a super unusual uh, amenity in North America, which is this building that's uh, over a thousand years old. Um, and we're in the middle of this campaign to um, have this have this uh, elevated to Georgia's first national park a campaign that we've been working together with the ancestors of the um, of the area and the Muscogee Creek Nation. So I'm really hoping that comes to fruition and more people will come experience this uh, deeply resonant place that's been um, a home to humans for so many millennia. That's super cool. I know the National Trust has been working with you guys on that project. Which yeah, is... um, just a couple of years ago, it was elevated from a monument to a National Historical Park. And that was that was a large part because of the National Trust involvement um, in helping us advance that. Um, it's a special place. And, you know, I, I think some of our prehistoric um, areas in the United States have been undervalued for far too long and, and obviously underrepresented in the types of places that we choose to preserve and promote. So I'm, I'm, ex I'm really excited about the future for, um, for Ogmulgee Mounds. Yeah, that's awesome. Tyrell, I wonder if, I know the Freedmanstown has a website. I, if while everyone is presenting, if you wanna see if you can pull that up, I know they have some images and not a lot, but um, that might be helping to show. Yeah, I looked at their site and I don't know if it's under construction because the main page is just one person in the area and it kind of yeah. focuses more on the woman than the buildings. But I, yeah, I've been hearing a lot about that place as well. Um, from other people who grew up in the Houston area, especially, they they have like a nice soft spot in the area for that. And they're really glad the work is being done around to save it. Yeah, and it's um, so, so close to downtown. I wish I'd seen it when I was in Houston for Pass Forward a couple of years ago, but for the next trip. Uh, Jordan. Yeah, my favorite sort of unknown space in Indianapolis is Central State Hospital. It's the state of Indiana's first mental hospital. It opened in 1848 on the west side of the city. Um, fortunately, it closed in 1994 as part of the national trend of deinstitutionalization. Um, but I really want to talk about the old pathology building, which now houses the Indiana Medical History Museum. It's this remarkably well-preserved research laboratory that really saw the transition from Victorian era science and medicine to the progressive era's birth and development of psychiatry and neurology. And it's so unique with its original furnishings and equipment, records and specimens. There's nothing like this anywhere else in the country. You really have to go to Europe to feel something like this. Um, and even the historic landscape is still evident. Um, this was a place of outdoor leisure. It was one of the places that offered a degree of freedom and autonomy to the patients in the hospital. It was part of the moral treatment, which was an ideology and approach involving how to treat mental disorders, thinking about how 
asylums had handled patients by restraining them and confining them and isolating them. And the moral treatment aimed to understand how our physical environment can enhance treatment. And you can still get little glimpse, glimpses of this um, beautifully landscaped campus. It's still kind of hidden um, under the brush and between the bushes and in the trees. And you can really understand sort of that standard of care the hospital was trying to provide to patients in its early history. Well, I think I found an image of it. So I'm gonna try and share it real quick. This is it, right? Yep, that's it. So you can see what it looks like. It looks like there's this great sort of website that tells you things about it. Just That's cool. the Medical History Museum's website. And um, we have a page on there called Voices from Central State where we'll be putting up more content related to the hospital and the grounds as I do some more research for them. Very cool. Um, Rosalind. Oh, did we skip Allison or you want me to go? I guess I'll go. I'll go. Go ahead, Rosalind, and then we'll go back to Ali. Sorry. <laughs> um, I'm gonna share an image. Can you see that? Okay. Um, so the site that I chose is um, a two-story craftsman-style residence in South Los Angeles. Um, known as um, the Hang Sedan, or also Young Korean Academy. And um, this property, um, this, this building was built in 1910, but the, um, the connection to the Hang Sedan starts um, in 1929. And um, the Hang Sedan organization was an important um, cultural organization um, in the early 1900s for the Korean American community. It was founded by Korean patriot An Chang Ho, um, which, who, who was um, leading efforts back in Korea to fight um, Japanese colonial rule. And so the organization's mission was to build civic and political leadership um, capacity um, for Korean independence movement um, movement um, back home, but um, kind of rallying people um, in the states. And so the organization was founded in San Francisco in 1913, and then it moved um, to Los Angeles a year later. Um, eventually, the organization was able to um, acquire this property. Um, first they rented it and then they um, purchased it. Um, this property is near um, USC and um, was recently purchased by a development company that um, intends to build a co-living um, kind of apartment student housing project. So the community um, learned about the threat to this property last year. And so um, the Los Angeles Conservancy in partnership with Asian and Pacific Islander Americans in Historic Preservation um, submitted an application for local landmark designation to, um, to slow down the process um, of development here and to really see if, they're, um, if the current owner and community members, which includes the um, existing LA chapter of the Hang Sedan organization could negotiate um, potential, hopefully um, acquisition of the property. There's interest there, but this um, property um, has changed um, over time. Um, you know, the property um, is, is over a hundred years old. So there have been some changes, but a, a lot of the historic fabric still um, remains, and we believe the preservation um, outcome is possible here. Um, there are very few landmarks, local landmarks in Los Angeles that represent the history of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. And so we really see this um, recognition as important to um, important right now. And so we're really hoping um, that this designation um, is successful and we are still in the process right now. 
It's a little bit about my site. A really close to night, only three sites is, it's a very small number. And so that's, I love the work that's going into trying to protect that place. Um, does anybody, I'm, I'm gonna actually show a quick picture real quick of, of the Freeman's town that I found. So we're, let's do that really quick, just so we can see. This is just, I believe one of the buildings with the marker. And I think this is an older image. Um, I know that they are doing a lot of work on the town right now, right? Correct? Yes, there's, the, the reason why I love the area so much was you still see some older homes, but some are rehabbed to the original condition and the area around it where some towns were, where some homes were torn down or actually getting new homes built. I mean, they're of a newer style, but the area is not being completely forgotten. So there's hope there to preserve a lot of their uh, older structures. Awesome. Um, I just want to make sure that we could see everyone's site. Um, that's, all of these are really great. Does anybody have any questions for each other about the sites that were shared? I mean, I'm the one who's obsessed with stained glass now, but and also about sites that fill in the gaps in the narrative, which as I mentioned in my introduction is something I really love. <laughs> and and Jordan's site is, is amazing. I, I did have the opportunity to visit on accident. I was trying to get into the asylum and found out that cops were very heavily in that area and we ended up at the museum and we didn't want to leave. It's a, a amazing space. Yeah, I think we still have Ali. You have to go, right? So, sorry if you guys hear a vacuum cleaner going in the background. Someone's designed the vacuums and stuff. But um, I guess my historical site or location would be the Pilsen neighborhood on the Lower West Side of Chicago, Illinois. Um, so just north of my house where I live right now in Bridgeport. And I think it's a very interesting neighborhood, um, especially with the concept of, you know, communities trying to survive with gentrification and the evolution of how the neighborhood's working out. Um, originally, it was a Bohemian neighborhood, so it was primarily Czech and, and Slavic. And then I believe in around the 50s, 1950s is when the Mexican community uh, moved in. So with my involvement with Landmarks Illinois and the Department of Buildings Historic Commission for the State of Chicago, we were trying to do a landmark designation on the 18th um, District Corridor, which is their main business corridor. And we were also trying to protect a series of murals that were from the Bohemian era of Pilsen, as well as the Mexican neighborhood. Um, and and it's, it's interesting to see the storytelling and how, again, the community evolved over the years. And sad to say, we, we didn't get a lot of support within the community to landmark the district or the murals. Um, but you know, we're hoping that a lot of gentrification will happen overnight. We're hoping that you know, the historic concept or appreciation of the different uh, cultures and heritages stay there. Um, you know, my, my mom actually immigrated to Pilsen when she came to Mexico. So it's kind of a dear place to my heart. And, you know, even when she comes into town and we kind of look for the house that she lived in, you know, it was demolished. So it's just the story of an anchor point for the community and just seeing again, how it's progressed over the years and a really good place for tacos if you're coming to town. Um. Awesome, Al, Ali, I think I, I, I wanted to show one of the murals. So I'm just gonna, it's me just pulling up things on the internet. That's just what I do. Um, <laughs> so I think this is an example of one of the murals. Um, but if you just Google the Pilsen neighborhood in Chicago and look at images on Google, you're gonna see a whole bunch of different awesome murals that Ali was talking about, which I think are really, really cool to see. Um, but yeah, I love the personal connection as well, um, which is great. Um, so I'll circle back again. Like, does anybody have questions for everyone, anyone about sites, about any of them? 
I, I just wanted to say thank you for sharing all these ideas because when I travel across the nation, I put these places on a map and I pin them and I'm like, I'm going to go there. <laughs> and it's just so neat to know about these little hidden places that were places hiding in plain sight that, you know, neighborhoods or streets you might not turn down. And I think that's part of um, the importance of the work that we do, you know, evangelizing these special places is to make sure that people know where they are and 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 what the access is like you know is it is it private property is it you know can you can you just walk up and go or or do you need to keep your distance because the cops are circulating around <laughs> you know um there's so many um issues of access to the properties themselves that we have to navigate as urban explorers and um curious folks <laughs> who like to see things up close so thanks for giving us some really cool places to pin on the map Great. Um, so for the book of the conversation, I came up with a, a prompt. <laughs> um, but obviously, as we talked earlier, you don't have to talk through everything if you don't want to. Um, but I thought it would be nice to ask you all, because so much has changed over the last two and a half years with the pandemic and all of the ways we do our work as historic preservationists. So I wanted to ask if you wouldn't mind sharing something you learned, something you relearned, and something you unlearned from the last two years. Um, just, just to sort of give us a sense of how things have gone. And I know as you guys answer that question, you'll tell us a little bit about bit more about who you are and what you do in your day jobs as well. So um, I don't know if anybody wants to start. I mean, I'll start, but you know. <laughs> so, so for so I'm president of the K Devils, and that is it seems like a full time job, but I've uh, I'm a manager at US Steel, and I've been a manager for this company for thirteen going on thirteen years. So in my free time, we do the nonprofit work, and we want to just get people excited about the community. So during COVID. Uh, two years of, you know, kind of being isolated, we learned as an organization just how to be more creative. Uh, things were going, we had like a, a, a repetitive, like a routine. We do X, Y, Z every single year. We just stick to the things that work. And we got our formula, we got our recipe is we can't mess it up. And COVID put everything on a pause. So by being more creative, we began to implement uh, bike rides, uh, historic bike rides through different neighborhoods throughout our city. And that was a way for us to social distance, yet still speak to the historic landmarks, why they're important, and also talk about the different organizations in those specific areas that are, you know, doing great things and being able to allow people to see it like up close and personal. So we were still able to share and inform the general public about what's going on in the city. Uh, we also created four books and published three. So we were very active on that end. It's like, well, you sit in the house, you have time to write, you have time to pull these things together because we're not hosting events. So we actually used that time to create these events. I mean, these books, the fourth one is a children's book that will come out next year about preservation. And all of that income that we do for our books, it is in turn our version of foreign fundraising because we can't do things in person. We can still sell the books online and get people excited about this is what we've done in the past lead up to this point and, you know, let them know about the future. Um, I had to relearn how to do more with less. That was a little bit tough because we had the woe is me moment. The world is coming down where our bank account is dwindling. And so we had to get real creative on how to just do more or less. And we kind of leaned on social media for that because uh, it was free. Our pictures were free. We have social media access. So it was like, let's talk about things that we've done before and things we would like to do and engage our core audience in that way. And the biggest thing that we had to unlearn was accepting uh, things from word of mouth. So we had a lot of money earmarked pre-COVID and we kind of put some other things on the back burner because we thought we had some guaranteed funds to come in that were gonna come in and 
that wasn't the case because people, and rightfully so, had to move their funds in different orders to support uh, the pandemic and other people who needed those funds more than we did. So that was just something that we just had to unlearn and said, you know, until you see a contract or something in writing, uh, keep pushing forward 110%. Uh, don't take the foot off to get uh, the foot off the pedal. So that's what we have on our end here in Gary. I know for go ahead, Josh. If you don't mind, Priya, off what Tyrell just said. I mean, we had a really similar experience. I, I think one of the things I unlearned was um taking for granted how delicate our, our situations are, right? I I mean you really take for granted living in a safe neighborhood, living in a functional economy, living with uh, um, democratic norms and um, and all this and the rule of law. And, and, and it was, I mean, it was terrifying when, when things started to collapse and we had business owners working, walking in for the first time and had never laid off anyone, did not know how to lay off anyone. And they were looking to us for answers. And um, and so one of the things we learned was was all the federal relief programs and all the unemployment programs so that we could try and set as soft a landing for everybody as possible. But um, I mean, one of the thing that I'd say I relearned from that experience is um, how much partnerships matter and how much. Um, you know, small businesses and family operated shops and the homes that we choose to live in are such an integral part of preservation that if you can't find a, a, an ongoing fuck, functional economic use for these places, it's it's really, really tough to secure uh, the next generation for any of these resources. And um, and it just became a really acute moment where that was um, that was really a, a, a serious concern that 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 a lot of our historic buildings weren't going to have um, uh, viable economic uses um, going forward. And so um, it's made me a lot more conscious of how important it is that, that people understand the choices they make on a day-to-day -day basis in the places they choose to have a business, in the places they choose to make a home, and, and when, they can, when they can prioritize um, having those uh, necessities take place in historic buildings, it really enriches the cultural life for everybody. And I do think the people who make those choices um, have a higher degree of uh, social responsibility uh, for each other because they see some of the interconnectedness in, in, in the world a little bit more easily. Um, and so I think there have been a lot of silver linings coming out of it. And, uh, and the one I really I, I will always take away is, is what a great responsibility we have to help take care of each other. I can go um, off of Josh. Um, I think with my job, it's been going nonstop, um, even during the beginning of the lockdown. But I think from what I had to unlearn and kind of relearn is being more empathetic um, and working, like Josh said, in a team building, um, because that's my profession. You know, I have to learn how to communicate with other architects, other engineers, owners, developers, and even homeowners. You know, I've had a handful of homeowners call me and say, we have a historic home and our building's falling down. Like, what do we do? Um, and just learning to kind of take a step back and just kind of do my best to help them and guide them through the process and just trying to reassure them that, you know, we're in a safe place. I'm not here to like, you know, hurt their, their house or, you know, hurt financially or just trying to help them. Um, so that was something within last years I've been, you know, unplugging and relearning how to work more with different types of professionals and more types of, uh, of communities, even homeowners and, and trying to help them as best as I can. Um, and, you know, it's just, I think that's something that kind of goes with our profession is just, you know, using our background, our education, our experience, and just trying to be tools and anchor points for people is something that's really key that I've been I've been learning a lot big time, and I guess nerdy nights you know with things I have been learning it's just about more about materials. So yeah, it's been an interesting couple of years. Oh, 
I'll add to to what um, folks have been sharing. Um, I think, you know, agree with everything that's been said. Also, um, ha it resonates a lot. Um, I think um, what's interesting, even though, like, you know, we're we experience, you know, this global pandemic. I, I think that the passion for for historic places didn't go away. You know, like it may not have been top of mind, you know, the survival um, was top of mind, but I think that um, the the interest and passion for historic places, at least with the folks that, you know, I, I interact with on, on a daily basis through through my job at the Conservancy, but also through through other other communities. Um, I, I think that I, I didn't see that go away. You know, I saw those communities kind of interact differently, you know, um, share information differently. You know, I think um, identified better efficiencies to, to do the work that, um, to continue the work um, during the pandemic despite challenges. So um, I think um, that was something that I think was really hopeful in terms of like, you know, that we, there's still a lot of people who care, um, even when things got really difficult. I'll go. Um, I can relate a lot to what Terrell was saying too about the just the whole collapse that happened when when COVID happened and the loss of revenue and income streams and different um, priorities that people had. So when that started to affect my own practice, which was tourism based, we were decimated. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever processed 500 refunds <laughs> before, but it's heartbreaking. Um, and so um, I, I decided at that point, you know, what what can I do? And, and what, how can I continue my work and in other ways and, and, you know, rely on my other strengths, which are journalism and reporting and um, content creation as it's now called today. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, after the initial shock uh, and, 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 you know, after the months passed and we realized things were never gonna be the same again, um, I really started to turn my focus inward and do some internal housekeeping with my business and the way that I present information to the public, just like, you know, Tyrell said, we wrote some books, <laughs> you know, um, I didn't write a book, but <laughs> I did continue to do a lot of research and to do a lot of field work that was very distant and, and also book oriented and archive oriented as well, lots of archiving. And so um, I, you know, it, it, in a way it was a blessing in disguise because I, I needed to do some housekeeping. I needed to tidy up the website, which is now 19 years old. I mean, the, the internet is a different place than it was 19 years ago. And so in terms of, of what I had to, to relearn was something as boring as search engine optimization, because if people can't find your content, they're not going to know it exists. And, and SEO is different today than it was 19 years ago. Google changed everything about four or five years ago. I don't know if you've noticed, but they did. And we've had to make changes to keep up with that to make sure the public is able to access our content. So um, that was my big boring project last summer <laughs> when was to do search engine optimization of my entire website to make sure Google could find my content again. And, um, you know, that, and that's a real issue that we have in, in digital archiving and in digital humanities is the internet and, and those search engines, those are our catalog. That's how it accesses, you know, our content. So that was my super boring relearning thing that I had to do. <laughs> um, the learning part I had to do was to learn video because that was the only way I could communicate with my people anymore was through social media. Um, because I was doing extreme social distancing, I was teaching full time online, you know, in my day job and all of those things. So um, video skills are always good to have in your arsenal. So if you don't, if you're not willing to learn them, get an intern who will, and who will teach you all the ropes because video is the way that people want to consume information today. We can write all these beautiful articles and, you know, micro blogs and things like that, but video is just where it's at and I don't think it's going to go away. And um, and then the other thing I learned to do was to embrace short format journalism a little bit more on my Instagram 
because I've always been really into my Instagram for like reaching out to the public. And that's, it's, that's how we save places guys is like people DM me on Instagram and they're like, do you see this? <laughs> and I'll go do a drive-by and I'll go see it and you can check up on its condition that this is our hub. Social media is our, in Phoenix, at least our hub for communication. Um, so I looked at, uh, you know, I already had a pretty strong presence in Instagram and was always posting my work in the field. I, I didn't have any even more work in the field, really. I wasn't going out and making visits like I used to. Um, so I really got inspired by Alice Rosshorn. Rosshorn? I don't know. If I'd, I'll write you her name down in chat. But um, she's a, a design historian as well. And she, she microblogs on her Instagram and does these amazing IG Live um, events and things like that. And I just got inspired by the way she was doing longer format captions that were really informative and very seriously researched rather than just me you know, out on the fly typing about Ralph Haver or something. Um, so I switched over to doing that kind of format of um, micro journalism and people loved it. They just ate it up. And it's been, it's been a great growth hack to reach out to new audiences because it's shareable content. And um, I've always wanted to make that change and the pandemic was the perfect opportunity to sit at home and type my Instagram captions. So. <laughs> Thinking back to everyone's comments about the economy taking a hit, you know, I was laid off from what I thought was my dream job. And I had to really unlearn my own job description, I guess, after getting laid off, you know, working in an archive and a library and a museum. That's not the only path for an architectural archivist. I had to be curious and take some risks. And I found so much fulfilling work out there working for myself. Like, yes, I'm still archiving now for the city's planning department, but I'm also researching landscape and natural history for a 58 mile section of a river in two counties for two tourism groups. I'm curating a history of housing discrimination exhibit for a fair housing advocacy nonprofit, I'm looking into stigmatized land and sites of trauma for the state's first mental hospital related to an unmarked but identified cemetery site. So in a way, I just had to think these are just really complicated reference questions. And I'm really, really enjoying sort of unlearning what I was capable of and applying it to being a small business owner. Um, and that's been great. As far as learn, learning that where you live matters, going back to what Josh said, if any of you are familiar with the National Fair Housing Alliance, they have this great infographic called Where You Live Matters. And I think it's really critical today when we think about the last couple of years and being kind of tied to our homes and everything about our quality of life is inherently tied to where we live and what we have access to in terms of jobs in transit and healthcare. You know, we have food deserts, we also have credit deserts and bank deserts. So thinking about housing and sort of that fair housing and housing discrimination side and applying that to preservation has been where my research has been going and I've learned so much in the last year thinking about where you live matters. This is amazing. I'm just listening to what everyone's talking about. And obviously there are a bunch of different common themes, right? There's this idea that we had to become more flexible in our work over the last two and a half years, also more creative. And then also just this general awareness we have about the flaws in preservation, but also in recognizing, just like Jordan just said, where we live matters and what's missing when you don't live in a place that has access to these different things that preservationists talk about, like walkable neighborhoods or access to good food places. And I'm thinking about the work of the Main Street Center, um, Main Street America and things like that. And I, I just really love hearing about all this. And then it all comes back to what Rosalind was saying with how like even when we were stuck at home, people were still looking for ways to to talk and see and visit historic places. I know so many people who ended up at national parks because those were open air spaces where you didn't have, you could socially distance. And I think that emphasizes just the power of place and the importance of all the different works work you do. Um, and then I think the other sort of thread I heard throughout everything was the importance of empathy and kindness and how we treat and work with each other as Ali was saying, but changing the way we talk to one another. And, so I really, really appreciate all of you sort of talking through those various themes. Um, did anybody have questions for anyone's comments besides me sort of summing up everything? 
So that Jordan, was a really good job. Nice work. <laughs> Jordan, uh, can you clarify? Did, did you say you started your own business? Are you a consultancy now? Yeah? How's it yeah. working out? I work with a lot of architects, developers, and planners on land use, change over time. It's, you know, hey, we have this unused public plaza we want to build a hotel on. And it's like, well, you demolished four historic hotels 40 years ago. You know, it's same use. So it's a lot of kind of amusing um, land use and change over time. But I also still do some archiving um, and a little bit of more museum exhibit kind of interpretation, but everything's kind of centered on the built environment, place, um, using the archives, a lot of neighborhood and kind of quality of life and, and housing policy. So it's, I'm, I'm kind of a space case, I'm kind of fluid, but it's all over the place, but it, in a way it just kind of connects in my brain and everything's just sort of, I always tell people, I'm not a hoarder, I'm an archivist, it's different. I'm just sort of hoarding all these different collections and resources and connecting the dots and trying to get people excited about the historic context of place so that it can be better stewards of the future. Yeah, and uh, Jordan actually is, uh, by the time people see this <laughs> event, uh, Jordan wrote a great piece for us about uh, the importance of city and municipal archives. It should go up this week, <laughs> uh, the, the week we are recording this, which is the end of April. Um, and then I know that Terrell wrote something for us uh, when he got his award and so that's also available and so uh, like I said that bio sheet that that link on the preservation month page I've linked to all these various pieces that um, I think a lot of you have written for us over the years just so people can read more about all your work and I've also made sure to link to all your websites um, so we're almost out of time but I thought maybe we we'd sort of collectively end on the question of, of joy and hope and you know, I know the pandemic's not over and things are still hard and we're dealing with a lot of different issues uh, about looking at our systems to make them more equitable. But I thought maybe we'd take a moment and talk about what brings you joy and what hope do you see in your work for the future? And um, again, we don't have to go in the same order that we've been going in, but if uh, someone would like to start, feel free to unmute yourself and go ahead. I'll go. Um... I guess joy-wise for last year, I've been doing a lot of presentations for cast iron. It became a, a material that I really love to work on. Um, and of course my coworkers and a lot of contractors were getting a little bit scared on how nerdy I became with that material, but it's fine. Um, but it's great because I've been doing a lot of presentations with Architectos, with the Structural Engineering Association. I recently did a, a big presentation with my coworker in Denver for the Steel Conference. And what the greatest thing, and it kind of ties to my love and joy of metals, but I'm impacting a lot of people that might not know the type of profession that I do in restoration work. Um, and a lot of, you know, students or even people, I have one good friend that runs with me, you know, she works for an accounting, or acts as an accounting for a big aviation company. And she just said, you know what? I want to study architecture and I've been helping her, you know, apply for grad school and stuff like that and kind of giving her some guidance. So I think it's tied to the joy of what I do for my, my job and what I've been learning and trying to educate people more about what I do. Um, but it's also impacting and influencing other people to realize there's more out there in our profession that you can definitely learn to. So I'm hoping with all the presentations I give, um, you know, we can get more people into our, our different fields and understand the importance of place in the community and our history. I'll jump in. Uh, for me, I get excited, uh, mainly when there's youth involvement in any in of any site period. Uh, just kind of thinking of like, what's that future of preservation gonna look like? I personally didn't know anything about preservation until probably six years ago at 30 years old. So when we do anything and I see youth involvement, uh, we just did something in Old Salem uh, with Sarah Marsham when we do our bike rides. And when you see neighborhood kids who just they weren't a part of the ride, but they see a group of people and they just jump in on their bike and come and listen and enjoy and learn. Those are the things that get me excited about, you know, our field moving forward. 
Yeah, very cool. And uh, what Terrell's talking about that he did with Sarah Marslam, who is also another Aspire Award winner, um, was an event with the National Council on Public History. And I heard that it was amazing. Um, it was a training program on site at Old Salem, right? Yes. And it's hard to ex explain it because it was a conference, but it I don't know, the on the more intimate setting and, you know, a lot more one-on-one -on -one time with individuals, I've, I've got a lot of positive feedback from everyone involved. So we look forward to doing more of those. And our next one actually is here in Gary at, at the end of October. Awesome. Hey, Sorry, go ahead, people. Allison. <laughs> uh, I also work with young people. I'm a professor, so I get to work with young people every day and they're just give me so much life from all of their energy. And, um, you know, I, I teach them methods of historical research and how to use history to enrich their lives and enrich their visual vocabulary and how historical themes and kind of the politics of and social aspects of the each era affect how people thought and lived and worked and shaped their lives. And, um, you know, just seeing them kind of really take that to heart and, and to embrace it and to ask the hard questions, you know, because the, the questions are hard now, <laughs> it's not easy. And um, they continue to kind of press forward and to, to be curious. And that always gives me hope. I have a lot of joys from a lot of silver linings that have come out, but I mean, one of the things I really appreciate is, uh, I, I, and I think this is durable, but I think people have a, more of a sensibility about the impacts of their daily choices. And as soon as the restaurants and shops in downtown Macon reopen, these families who are stewards of our most important architectural resources, those were the people, those are the places that people were most excited about. And those are the losses I think they felt most acutely because those are the places that are birthdays, anniversaries, engagements. You know, they're where we choose to center our lives, but I don't know if we were as aware of that as we are now. And, and so seeing the amount of um, intention that people are bringing back to where they choose to shop and dine and live has been really, really encouraging. And I think it may mark a, a serious transition point that's gonna be helpful for the movement going forward. I think what um, brings me a lot of joy or brought me joy um, during these last few years is just finding ways to create communities um, through um, the work at the Conservancy. We launched a um, community leadership boot camp um, during the pandemic. Um, well, we, it was planned to launch before, um, you know, we knew that the pandemic was happening. So it was going to be an in-person um, program. And we did, we had to shift to virtual, but 58 people have um, gone through the program since the launch. And it's just really exciting that, you know, a lot of people have taken an interest in learning more um, um, about, you know, how to be a better advocate for historic places. So that brings me a lot of joy that, um, you know, we're, we're able to, to be a resource and help empower people um, in that way. thinking about joy, hope, relief, um, you know, the last few years have really forced needed conversations to happen. It's hard, it's uncomfortable, it's messy, but we need to talk about things like labor equity and pay equity, climate equity, which, you know, I read a whole lot about and then wrote a little bit for the trust on, um, you know, thinking about pushing back, being critical, being collaborative, we're gonna be stronger together the more organized and unified we are. And I feel like the last couple of years, there is more, we have more organizing strength the more we connect with different institutions and positions and professions, and we're not so siloed that we can really build on each other and work together. That's a really great point to end on. And I'll, I'll just toss in my two cents. and. And that is, I get joy from working with all of you. I, my job is content creation, as Allison says, um, but the best part is getting to talk to the people in the field, doing the work and sharing your stories and the places you're trying to save. So I really, really appreciate all of you coming to talk to us and telling us about what's been going on 
over the last two years. And I just remind everyone watching that uh, to get more information on everyone here, go to savingplaces.org slash preservation hyphen month. Um, but also while you're there, check out the other events that are going on this month, along with uh, the many, many stories that we'll be sharing on Saving Places over the coming weeks. Um, so again, thank you everyone for coming. This has been so much fun and so great to talk to you and see you all in person. Uh, <laughs> um, and I look forward to seeing you guys face-to-face -face sometime soon. Um, have a great preservation month. Thanks everyone. Yes, have a good one.